How are you doing? Awesome. Um, my name's not Wayne, just so you guys know. <laughs> I, I'm uh, Kobe Sutter, and just to let you guys know, I am. Uh, I kind of someone asked me where I pastor earlier, and I'm like, I'm a little different. I, I have a few jobs, so I'm a interim pastor out in uh, Manlius, New York, and I am a connections pastor out in Binghamton, New York. So that means basically I don't like to have any free time whatsoever. I like to pastor at two different churches. <laughs> and I wanted to say real fast that preaching here at your guys' church, this is my third time actually, is one of the greatest honors of my life. I rank it up there in my top five favorite honors. Because if you guys know Wayne, he's very um, opinionated, which I love, but <laughs> he wouldn't let just anyone get in his pulpit and preach the word of God. So I take that as a huge honor, and I just want to thank him and the Wagner family, um, even though, thank you. yes, you're welcome. We, we have a relationship where we meet maybe like once a year for lunch, and um, so <laughs> I got distracted with it. Is, this a, is that good right there? I can move it all the way over here if you want to. All right, I'll do that for you. <laughs> Dory, I have ADHD, so I'll be all over the place anyways. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before I get started, I want to, before I ask you that question, let me go into this for a second. Whenever I preach at churches, and I do a lot, I do a lot of traveling, speaking, a lot of traveling, ministering, and I have my own two churches that I preach at. So I know a lot of Christians, and I mingle with a lot of Christians. And one of the things I love to ask Christians for the last couple of years is this. Um, how was church today? I've been doing this for years. How, how was church today? And I usually get one of these responses. I either get the message was phenomenal or the pastor did a great job. <laughs> or I get um, every now and then the worship was amazing, which today's worship was amazing. Um, or the other two I get, they're lesser on the scale. I get the building was great, had a great atmosphere. <laughs> and then one of my other favorites, because I was a, a youth pastor at a Methodist church for a couple years, is the snacks were amazing. <laughs> um, every time after church, I get this all the time. They're like, oh, the snacks were amazing. But I hardly ever hear, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't hear Jesus was amazing. I fell more in love with Jesus when I left than when I was here, when I came in. Um, I think we live in a society where our focus has been put on man and situations and buildings and programs, and we've gotten our focus off of Jesus, the reason why we come together in fellowship with each other. So my one goal today, I actually had a message all planned out about a couple days ago when the Lord switched it up and changed it at the last minute, and this is my one goal, and whenever I preach it's the same goal, but this is my goal for today's message, a nice simple message that will do this, that will get us closer to Jesus, loving him just a little bit more than when we came in here today. I'm going to repeat that one more time. My main goal, my main purpose for today is so every single person in this room just loves Jesus a little bit more than when they came in. They're just a little bit closer to Jesus than when we came in. All right, so if you guys will bow your heads with me and we'll pray. Father, I thank you so much for every single person in this room. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, and I ask that your Holy Spirit just comes in this place right now and fills this place, Father. That you use me to speak your words, that your words changes every single person in this room, that none of us leave this place the same that we learn more about you and we just fall more in love with you so we can represent you into the community, Father. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message is this, Stay in the Dust. I'll explain what that means towards the end, but if you're taking notes, write down, Stay in the Dust. And every time I preach, I do say this, if you take notes, you're more likely to get into heaven than if you don't take notes. So if you're taking notes, right, stay in the dust. And I'll give you ways to stay in the dust. Um, if you want to, actually, we'll wake up a little bit, because I like to do that when I speak to you. If you want to turn to your neighbor and say, stay in the dust. <laughs> now, turn to the second neighbor, the one that you didn't care about the first time, the one you kind of ignored. Turn to that person and say, I have no idea what that means. 
So today we will talk about staying in the dust. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give two stories using Peter as an example. One story when he was in the, well, one story when he was out of the dust. His focus was off of Jesus and the result in that. Then a story about a week later that was Peter in the dust, focused on Jesus and the outcome of that with the goal that we just get to know Jesus a little bit more. We fall in love with Jesus a little bit more. So a couple, about a year ago now, I was speaking at a retreat, actually. It was a two-day retreat. It was three messages a day for a high school out in Pennsylvania. And this was a, a phenomenal thing. I, I love speaking to teenagers, mostly because I'm very mature and I act like a teenager. Um, so I was speaking to these teenagers <laughs> And one of the things I did the very last day is I challenged this group to take their focus off themselves and put it on the community, to do something in their community or a community that would put their focus on Jesus and off themselves. So this one kid in particular really stuck out to me. Um, we would get talking to each other, and the first night we actually stayed up to 3 a.m. in the morning, just talking back and forth, cracking jokes, Borderline inappropriate, but not just because <laughs> when I start just cracking jokes, you don't know where I'll go. And same with him. We were talking crazy. We were just having a good time. And what I've noticed about this kid was this. He was fully engaged in our conversation. I never met a teenager that didn't pull out his cell phone, that didn't start looking away, that didn't start changing the subject. He wanted to know everything he could about you. He wanted to know everything he could about the person. He was just eyes locked and asking questions, leading questions. And I just remember being so amazed with this young man. And one of the projects that he decided to do was to raise money for a cement mixer for the DR. And he actually raised $2,000 to do this out at the DR to raise a cement mixer so they could um, make, I think, a fish hatchery. <laughs> and the last day of the retreat, he says this. He goes up in front of his entire school and says this. Picture this, high school, you know what I mean? Your senior year, you wanna fit in, you wanna be cool. Um, he actually had tears in his eyes. And he said, the thing that stuck out to me the most about this retreat was, I wanna know Jesus like Kobe knows Jesus. And that was one of the other, like I said, top five honorable things that anyone's ever said to me. I remember just sitting back going, wow, that's amazing. I pulled him aside afterwards and I said, you, one of the ways to know Jesus more is to stay in the dust, watch what you focus on. And we will touch that story at the very end of the result of where that went. So if you guys will open up to me, or open up to Acts 3, we're going to start in verse 1. And we'll read 2, verse 6. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple, to the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to take alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave his attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. With the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he was actually made well. And what I want to talk about is what happened in that story, but we're going to look at a few, a week to two before this story actually took place, and then we're going to compare it to this actual story. So, right before this story takes place, if you guys know the Bible, which I'm sure you all do, Jesus has already been killed, he's already resurrected, and he's already ascended to heaven. So Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. Um, about a week before this, and remember we're talking about what it means to be focused on Jesus and what it means not to be focused on Jesus we're going to talk about staying in the dust. About a week before this scenario took place, um, you can find it in John. You find Peter and John walking with Jesus. His focus, we're going to learn, is in a different place right now. 
he, he's walking with Jesus and Jesus stops them. And he's like, hey, I'm going to give my body up for sacrifice. And I'm going to be killed. But don't worry, I'll be back. See you in like three days. See you Sunday. I don't know if it was actually Sunday. Um, he's like, I'll see you in like three days. I'll, I'll be back. And if you remember, Peter actually rebuked him. It was like, ah, that's not going to happen. He took his focus off of, off of Jesus and put it on himself. He started to get nervous. So actually when Jesus actually got captured and got beaten and got um, manipulated and just got thrown into jail and tortured, we see Peter now change up his entire atmosphere. He's walking with Jesus for three years, and we see Peter now realizing the scenario, the situation. And he actually, if you guys remember, he denies Jesus three times in John 18. He's like, uh, I don't know that man. This girl comes up to him and is like, um, this guy's with Jesus. And Peter's like, I don't know Jesus. And then another guy comes up to him and is like, this guy's with Jesus. He's like, nah, I, I don't know Jesus. And then the Pharisees come up to him and say, like, you, you go with Jesus, don't you? And Peter's like, no, no, I don't know Jesus. He took his focus off of Jesus now, and he put it on himself. When we put our focus on ourselves, we start getting scared. We start getting nervous. We start thinking things aren't working out the way they're supposed to work out. And when we put them on ourselves, we become selfish. We become self-absorbed. And then if you remember, Jesus actually dies. He gets crucified. And now you find Peter and John completely out of character. One of my favorite verses, it's, I have it written down because I won't remember the exact verse, is um, John 20, 19, if you guys want to look it up later. We find, and I think a lot of people overread this a lot of times, we find Peter and John now hiding behind closed doors, shaking and scared because they took their focus off Jesus and now they're focused so much on themselves. They are nervous. They are scared. They don't know what's going to happen. They're scared of the Pharisees. They're scared of the Romans are coming to kill them. We find Peter and John, these great men, these fishermen, these manly men, petrified and scared, not knowing what to do. Because of this, they thought Jesus was going to be the answer to all their problems, but they looked at it differently. They didn't see it the way Jesus saw it. They actually thought they were going to overthrow the government. They actually thought they were going to rule the land. They actually thought they were going to become and throw out the Pharisees, and they were going to be the world dominators. So they think these things are going not going their way. They realize, hey, this is what we thought was going to happen, but now it's not going this way. And what God really put in my spirit to tell you guys is this, is how do you act, what do you focus on when things don't go the way you thought they were going to go? When the situation at hand that you're believing God to do doesn't go the way you thought was supposed to go, what do you focus on? As we see Peter and John, we're focusing on Peter and John, and they were in fear. They were hopeless. They were nervous. And then Jesus comes in, in verse John 20, 22, comes in and goes, I love it because he kind of just like appears. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> That's how I picture it. He kind of appears behind him. He's like, peace be with you. And um, <laughs> so innocently, they're all calm. They're like, oh. Oh, peace. And one of my other favorite lines is it says this. He, he blew on them. He blew the Holy Spirit on them, it says. Just like in Genesis where God blew life on the people. So Jesus says, peace be with you. And he blows Holy Spirit on them. Like, oh. And then suddenly they become bold and strong. And Jesus says to them, as the Lord has sent me, I now send you. Go off. And that's where we pick up this story in Acts. But I want you guys to realize the moral of this story particular story when we're not focused on Jesus when we're not walking in the dust we have no hope we're hopeless and the moral of this was was Peter was focused on Peter during his trials during the situation and that produced fear that produced an outcome they didn't know or expect and that produced no hope but as soon as he saw Jesus in a different light in a different scenario Everything changed from that day on. Nothing was ever the same again for Peter and John. Just because they saw Jesus like that in a different light. They saw Jesus revealed from the Old Testament all the way to the Torah, the five books of the Bible, all the way up into now. And they were like, oh my goodness, this is real now. And then we find Peter in Acts 3, right here where we left off. He's walking with John and they're going to the temple. They're about to go in and pray, and this guy is sitting there who's been lame for 40 years, is reaching up, and he's like, money for the poor. And <laughs> what I like about Peter is he's like, look at us. 
As long as we roll in Escalades and have jets and planes, we, we have nothing. But what we do have, we give to you. And they say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he grabs them. See, now, this is showing us he has the guy in the situation who's crippled, who's in fear, who's focusing on himself. He tells him, take your focus off yourself, put it on Jesus, and watch your life change. This guy's life changed. And then they get up and it says, they actually start galloping, I made that part up, and walking and praising God and walking into the temple. Now, mind you, this is the same temple. i got to fix this because my ear... I start moving, my ADHD kicks in, I get a little into it. So, <laughs> remind you, this is the same area, the same temple where they tried Jesus. These are the same Jews, the same Pharisees that tried and plotted to kill Jesus and kidnapped him in the middle of the night, that tried him in the middle of the night and plotted to kill him and had him killed. And now they walk in there to pray, skipping and folding hands and, and all happy because this guy's healed. And everyone starts going, oh my goodness, did you see so-and-so, we'll call him Dave. Did you see Dave? He's walking. He hasn't walked in 40 years. How is he walking? And then we see Peter, who's this awesome. He walks in and everyone's gathered. He's like, why are you guys amazed? And then if we notice, if we look closely, I think we overlook this a lot. Peter says, don't look to me. Why are you guys looking at me like I did something? Jesus did this. Mind you, the same temple that they tried Jesus, the same guy who was hiding behind closed doors not even a week ago, petrified, saw something that changed him so much inside because he saw Jesus in a new light. He's confronting everyone now, saying, Jesus is the one that raised him. And then he goes into this accusation. To me, um, I always, when I talk, I always talk about how people are gangster. Peter, it's the gangster war today for being the most gangster in the Bible today. He goes into accusation and says, you know, the one that you guys set up to get killed. And they're like kind of back up. You can picture it kind of backing up. He's like, you know, the one that you guys denied as the Lord and Savior. The one that Pilate wanted to let go. But you all said no. The one that you wanted a murderer to let go instead of him. The one that you guys killed and crucified. And then he goes in with this bigger, I think, is like the gut punch. He's like... You know, the guy that resulted in you all killing the author of life, the one who gives life, that's the one you guys killed. But then he goes in and says, but don't worry. If you have asked for forgiveness, because we know you did it out of ignorance, he'll forgive you and come follow him. And then the scene shifts. Now picture, if we're talking about focus and no focus. He's focused so much on Jesus and he doesn't care about his situation. He doesn't care what's going on. Just like when we focus on Jesus, situations change, and we get out of ourselves. And then the evil emperors walk in. So I picture Darth Vader and his crew. They're like, boom, 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 boom. I can't do the Imperial March. Uh, my nephew probably could. So Darth Vader walks in with his Imperial crew, and it's the Pharisees. It's the high Israelites, the leaders. They walk in, and Jesus or Peter keeps going. So these are the actual ones who plotted to kill Jesus, who grabbed him and had him murdered. He now sees them walk in with their Darth Vader mask and kind of floating. And he looks at them, and he keeps on going. He's like, the one that was resurrected from the dead. And now, if you know anything about Jewish history and culture, they hated anything taught about resurrection of dead. As soon as something was dead, it was unclean. As soon as it was unclean, you couldn't touch it. It was gone forever. So he's preaching the resurrection of the dead. So now they are extremely mad, and they do what everybody does in the Old Testament and New Testament. They start like, ripping off their clothes and stuff, which is this weird. They always say, you know, when people are mad, they're like, oh. So I'm picturing this group of Darth Vader-looking people ripping off their clothes. So they rip off, and they're angry. And it says they laid hands on them. If anyone grew up kind of like I grew up, you know what that means. They put in some work on him. They kind of beat Peter and John down and then threw him into prison. So we see this. Peter now is in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to die or not because he just killed Jesus about a week ago. These same people. And mind you, Peter, when he was focused on himself, was petrified, hiding behind closed doors, scared. But what did he see that changed him in one week? Think about Peter... If, even if you don't read the Bible, it's a, a real man in history. It's, it's like Abraham Lincoln. It's like he existed, and his documentation existed that this man died for his faith. So he saw something, the resurrection of Jesus, that caused him to be so full of faith, he looked at death in the face and didn't care anymore. So he could see him in trial. He's in trial now. And there's 70 Jewish leaders around in the courtroom. 
and the high priest of the land. So this guy has all the authority in the land. He looks at him, and to me this is kind of, actually kind of gangster, something I probably would have said. He looks at him and he's like, by whose authority did you do this under? So he's asking Peter now, whose authority did you do this? And Peter answers amazingly. He's like, so wait, you're asking me by whose authority this great deed was done? That this man was healed, who's been lame for 40 years? Is that who you're asking me whose authority I did this under? And then he takes the focus off himself again. He says, it wasn't me. I did this under the authority of Jesus Christ. And then he keeps going. Picture this. These are the guys who just killed Jesus once again. His focus is so off him and on Jesus. He keeps going and goes like this. You know the one that you guys crucified. The one that you guys killed. The one that you guys murdered. That's who I did this under. That's who authority did this. Because God raised him from the dead. And I did it under his authority. And salvation, there's no other salvation, no one else's name other than Jesus Christ. And they were just marveled. And they even said this. They said, we could tell these uneducated men were now with Jesus by the way they spoke. So I ask you this. How do you speak in your situation, in the time of trial? How do you act? Do, can people tell that you are with Jesus? Or do people tell that you are concentrated on the situation you're at or the scenario you're in? Where is your focus when you're in trials and situations? Are you in the dust, which we'll define now in a second? Or are you out on your own, focused somewhere else? Because when you're in the dust, you stay focused on Jesus. So I'm gonna tell you guys what in the dust means. It's actually one of my favorite terms. Um, and I'll set it up, I'll give you the Hebrew word for it, um, what it means. But who in here would consider themselves a disciple? A lot of Christians always call themselves disciples of God, um, disciple. So who in here would consider themselves a disciple? Okay, so we'll define what this means. We had like four hands. First service, we had like 50 hands. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> disciple. This is what I meant. Back in the culture of this time, being in the dust, disciple, this is what it meant. Um, so, rabbis in the time of Jesus and the time after were actually considered like the all-stars. They were like the people to be around. Everyone wanted to be like a rabbi. They were the teachers. They were the smart people. Everyone wanted to see what it was like to be a rabbi. So actually, what they would do, there was actually towns dedicated to building up young men to become disciples. And what these young men would do after they were raised, they were taught the Torah, the five books of the Bible, from the first day of birth on. And when they thought they were ready, they would go up to a rabbi and say, they'd pick the rabbi that they thought was the most interesting rabbi, the best speaker, or, or the one they wanted to be like. And they would say, can I be your disciple? But they use a different word, which we'll explain in a minute. And then the rabbi would watch them for a couple days, usually. They'd watch their behaviors. They'd ask them a bunch of questions. Sometimes they'd let you live with them for a few days because when they accepted you, you would go live with them 24 hours a day for years and years and years and years studying with them to become like them. So then the rabbi would either accept you or reject you. He would say, ah, not good enough, not smart enough. Um, they actually rejected a lot more than they accepted because they could only take one or two people to be their disciples. So it's actually, historians believe that Peter and John grew up in the same town where these young men wanted to become disciples and they were probably rejected because they were at the age now where they were become fishermen they're out doing their own things. If you were rejected, you would start your own parents' business or the family business and go out and do it. So the concept of staying in the dust was an actual term rabbis used back then to say, when you follow me, I want you to walk so close to me at all times. This was a concept that everyone knew, and I think we've lost this concept in the Christian faith. Um, that my dust from my shoes kick up on you, gets up on your shirt, gets up in your hair, gets up in your mouth, gets up all over your body. Be so close to me that when I stop, you stop. When I turn right, you turn right. When I turn left, 
you turn left. These young Jewish men would go to bed when, they went, when the rabbi went to bed, would eat when the rabbi ate, would follow them everywhere because the main goal was this. You actually wanted to become the rabbi that you were following. You wanted to become them. So the actual Hebrew word for disciple was telemid, T-A-L-I-M-I-D, telemid. And it meant mimic a teacher. It meant connect and join. The word actually, the mid in telemid means connect or join together. Um, the word tail in telemid means a daily burnt offering. So the concept behind it was to offer your body to the rabbi you're following, it's a daily burnt offering that you'd become so close to the rabbi that you'd be in his dust, consumed with his every movement, so you could, the main goal was this, consume and become the rabbi. You wanted to actually become who you were following. So when Jesus stepped on the scene, the ultimate rabbi, he comes out, and if you guys, like I just said, these people would ask the rabbi and the rabbi would reject them. He's the first one ever to change society completely around. He would go up and ask you to follow him, which was unheard of in that time because all these people were rejected, just like they believe Peter and John were rejected. Jesus went up to them, the rejected, and said, come follow me. Pick up your cross and follow me, which actually if you break down in the Hebrew means this, come be like me. Stay in my dust. Become like me because Jesus believes in you and believes in you and believes in all of us where he takes the rejected and makes them whole with him and says, come, be like me. Love me a little bit more. Get to know me a little bit more. Stay in my dust. So I ask you this, how consumed are you with being like Jesus? How consumed are you? And remember my goal at the beginning of this message for us to see Jesus a little bit closer, to love him a little bit more, to leave this place a little bit more in love with Jesus so we can love others like he did. How consumed are you with being like Jesus? And before you tell me, yeah, pretty consumed, if you gossip, if you talk behind people's back, if you complain all the time, if you're worried in whatever situation you're in, if you're always nervous, you're not really consumed with Jesus every aspect of your life. I don't think any of us are. It's a process. And that's why I'm here today to say, let's get a little bit closer today to that process of trying to be like Jesus and staying in his dust. So when he stops, I stop. When he moves, I move. Because here's the thing. When you're in the dust of somebody, in the dust of Jesus, you're focused solely on him. Now your focus is off yourself and on him. Your focus is off your needs and your worries and your concerns, and now they're on Jesus. Because the minute we stop focusing on Jesus, we miss stuff. We start getting a little more separated from him. We start, stop loving as much as he wants us to love. We stop caring as much as he wants us to care, and we become lost at times if we completely lose focus of Jesus. So that's why staying in the dust is so important. So as I start to conclude, I'm going to give you three ways to stay in the dust. And I want to finish with a story that I started with. So I go to the school because I challenge these kids to do this project. And I go to their school to see who did it. And actually three groups did it, which was impressive. I didn't figure anyone would do it in high school. Um, <laughs> And I brought, the, I brought them pizza, the three groups that did it. Like I said, this young man who was engulfed in people's conversations, who was always in the moment, um, raised $2,000, which is unheard of for a high school kid, for, like I said, a cement mixer, um, to build a fish hatchery. Because they would go to the DR, and they wanted to build a fish hatchery to teach these people to have fish instead of just offering a one-time service that they could feed themselves, kind of like Jesus. So I leave the school. And I get a text a couple months later. I'm not sure the exact time, but a couple months later, I get a text from his teacher. And it says, please play for this young man. He's about to go into surgery. And they're like, it's a serious surgery, but he's very high spirits, and um, he's, he's excited about the surgery. So I hang up the phone. Or no, I, I text back first, and I'm like, what, what kind of surgery? And he goes in and explains how this young man was born with a heart condition. So he needed a um, reroute something in his heart. 
I remember thinking, as I heard this, that you would never have known this if you met this kid. Because I spent so much time with him, I'm like, God, he never talks about his condition. He's always talking about other people. He's always enjoying life so much. He's always in the moment. He's always in the dust of each person's conversation. You would never know he has an issue. And then, about a week after that, as I'm sitting at his funeral, I remember crying because this could change my life so much at just 17 years old. I'm sitting at his funeral hearing these stories about how he was always in the moment. He was always consumed with people. He was always so full of life that he represented Jesus wherever he went. And then I remember crying, hearing his words going, man, when he said, I wanna know Jesus like Colby. I remember the Holy Spirit kind of took over. I remember going, I have never met anyone more like Jesus than this young man in his life. And the things I pulled from his life and from Peter's life and how we can stay in the dust is this, live, love, Look. Live, love, look. From this young man to what we see Peter when he was completely in the dust, completely obsessed with Jesus, same with this young man, completely in love with other people and other conversations. He lived, just like Peter lived, like Jesus in every situation. So if we want to stay in the dust, our focus on Jesus, we need to live like him in every situation. We need to look like Jesus which means putting others first. Loving others like Jesus loved. By consuming our lives with other people, by serving them. Um, I got the points confused, that's love. So, and then look, is we need to look for Jesus in every situation. Every situation we go through in life, we can't have the outcome the way we want it to go a lot of times. Just like Peter couldn't have the outcome he wanted when Jesus said he was about to die and then he loses them and he's petrified of what's gonna happen. Outcomes change, but Jesus doesn't. He's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. And if we look for Jesus in every situation, we can glorify him in every situation, no matter what we're going through. And we can become more closer to my goal, like I was saying, a little bit more in love with Jesus. The more we live, look, and love like Jesus, the more we'll stay focused on him, and the more we'll impact our world, and the more we'll impact other people, and the more we can show people the love of God, and the more people will be like, why are those Christians so different? They're so just happy. They're so content in no matter what situation they're in. They're so in love with other people. They're so engaged, like I say, in this young man, in the conversations that you don't even know there's anything else going around. Could you imagine, and this is one of my challenges for us as I end right here, could you imagine if we stayed engaged in people's conversations? like Jesus would if he was here today. Nowadays, everyone pulls out their cell phone and starts talking to other people, or they're looking around at squirrels and everything else, yeah. their ADHD age kitchen. But could you imagine if we just focused in and never looked away and just like, oh man, how, how's your life going? It's awesome. How was this? You're also about to get married. See, that I do know. <laughs> um, but if we stay focused in conversations, we would change the world. We would change our community. We would change other people. So my challenge for you is this today, is to love Jesus by staying in his dust, staying focused on him by loving other people and staying engaged in conversations and looking for ways to live like Jesus, love like Jesus, and look like Jesus no matter what we are facing in life. And watch people's lives around us change. Watch the community change. Watch whatever situation we're in change because Jesus changes situations and Jesus' love sets us free and Jesus' love gives us hope. And if we can give hope to other people, other people will start feeling, oh my goodness, why are they different? I wanna have hope like that. I wanna be like that. And if we do that, we can change your world, our communities, our churches. We can watch this Christian faith grow like it used to more and more because people will be on fire for God. If we can, as I restate my goal one more time, just learn to love Jesus a little bit more each and every day. A simple concept, but a life-changing concept. By staying so focused on him that we're in his dust, getting that dirt all over us. So when we're with other people, that dust brushes off on others. 
that Jesus, that dust from being on Jesus starts brushing off and others and changing other people. So if you guys will bow your heads with me and we'll pray.